In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Most gracious, loving Father, we gather in the name of Jesus and your Holy Spirit that this day in this series dedicated to brokenness but unto new life, may we have hearts that are attentive to your word, Jesus, who has taken upon himself our brokenness that we might share in his new life. We ask this in the name of Jesus, our Lord. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. In this series, Brokenness Unto New Life, I'd like to begin by giving sort of a panoramic vision of brokenness, but also broken but love. I'd like to show you one of the great important emphases is that I have found in entering into the Eastern Christian churches. I was greatly privileged as a Jesuit to be ordained in the Russian Byzantine Rite and then to do doctoral work and spend years of teaching this approach to Christian spirituality. And one the great graces in my life was to see how the great theologians of the early Eastern churches who gave us these great dogmas of the true divinity of Jesus, who was not merely man, but he was God also, and of the Trinity, that God is not just a mere monotheistic God, but he was a community of loving persons and that community bursts out to create this world, all in order that we may share in God's great community, God's very own life, be participators as 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 4 says. We are called by God to be participators of God's very own nature. And so I found this continuous emphasis between the realization on the part of the individual Christian and the Christian earthly community, the body of Christ in pilgrimage, we the viators, the pilgrims, with our brokenness. And therefore, we should have evolved this sense of knowledge of ourselves in the not yet. And this is what I would prefer to call brokenness, rather than sin. For I think most of us who have defined sin through the Baltimore Catechism have made it so legalistic that it's unreal. It isn't dealing with our own human situation, our history. Isn't it true that we define sin as a serious violation with full deliberation and consent? against a law of God. Well, in brokenness, the Eastern Fathers saw that it was any obstacle, regardless of how it got there into our lives, and how this brokenness came into our world, into our worldly situations, into our political and economic worlds, in our own church itself in its fail history of not only being the bride spotless, sine macula, sine ruga, without stain, without blemish, and yet always the harlot, the wife of Ose, unfaithful, always running out into the desert to immerse herself in more pleasures. We are always caught in that brokenness. We are always stretching out for that new life, and yet we already have the life of God living in us. I travel a great deal around the United States, Canada, and have preached in many parts of the world. But regardless of what parish, be it an Orthodox, a Protestant, or a Catholic parish, I think 
one could easily divide all parishioners of a given parish into two parts. Those who are totally unaware of themselves below the surface of their mind, where their mind says, I'm okay, there's nothing wrong with me, I don't need a conversion. The person isn't even aware in, in human relationships that there are these, as St. Augustine says in the 10th book of his Confessions, the lamentable abysses of darkness that lie below the surface of my mind. That when I credit myself with not being sinful, I must suspect that. I must doubt that because of these powers deep within us. So this first class have not a clue as to who they are in their past and in the present and in the predetermined future that will flow out of the past present unless they have a conversion. And God always is sort of like an object. We go to God and we ask for God's attention. We get angry when he doesn't answer our prayers. Priests are always hearing, Father, why doesn't God answer our prayers? Why do I have to suffer? Why did God cause this death? Why this? Why that? These are hardly Christians, for they are the center, and God is just an object. But I formulated the Maloney Law. As you pray to God, so you relate to your neighbor. If God is an object to answer your petitions, then your neighbor is going to be exploited and manipulated by you. You're going to make judgments on them as though you are God. You congratulate God because God thinks as you think, and therefore there's nothing wrong with you, but it's always other people. The second class, those who are really broken people, and they are aware of it. And this, you don't need a psychologist to tell you. You must be in touch with your history. And how do you know your history except to look at today? Out of your heart flow these thoughts. Where your treasure is, Luke chapter 6 tells us. There is your heart. Thus you can see that brokenness is okay. We are all broken in some degree or other. Jesus was born into brokenness. He accepted to be born of Mary who had a bloodline as you and I. She was human. To be human is to be born into that original sin of our proto-parents, Adam and Eve. But then, what are we going to do about this brokenness? Ah, the movement of the Holy Spirit. That spirit that drove the Israelites into the desert, and there God became God by deeper faith instilled into their hearts, but also to see how often they wanted to build their golden calf or go back to the flesh pots of Egypt, to go back to slavery. And thus, the first movement of the spirit that drove Jesus into the desert and tempted him for 40 days and 40 nights drives us deeper beyond the sinful, or at least the, our intellect that is so impregnated by self-centeredness, bias towards self, self-love. And unless we can go deeper, driven by the Spirit, and come to know the abyss, that volcanic material that we have inherited through our parents' bloodline, that we have compounded by our own willfulness, our own sinfulness, where we've made choices not to live out our baptismal vow, but rather to forget it and live in the kingdom of darkness and yield to the wiles of Satan, which is a powerful mythic language to describe selfishness.